Okay, we all set? All right, let's, let's get started. And let me say good afternoon to everyone. And I'm joined today uh, by several council members, uh, Council Member Shabazz, Council Member Thomas, Council Member Pollitt, Council Member Cisneros. Did I miss out any? Council, uh, did I miss anyone? I think I everybody. Okay. Um, and I'm also joined today uh, by Clay Hicks, president of the Houston Apartment Association, uh, Donna Carney with Lone Star Legal Aid, uh, council member Tiffany Thomas that you'll hear from uh, shortly, and Tom McCaslin, director of housing and community uh, development, um, and a member of the Housing Stability Task Force. I want to begin today uh, COVID-19 with, with today's numbers on COVID-19 uh, from the Houston Health Department. Uh, but they are not connected uh, necessarily to the announcement that we'll be making right now. The Houston Health Department reports uh, 1,554 new cases. That's 1,554 uh, new cases of COVID-19 today, bringing Houston's total number to 46,969. Sadly, we are adding 18. That is a, that is a record for us because the previous number had been 16. So sadly, we are adding 18 uh, newly reported deaths, bringing the city's total to 450. Uh, each death is listed on the screens next to, um, next to the stage. It certainly does become a problem uh, when it takes too much time to go through each and every one of them. Um, and so uh, please take a look, there are 18. Uh, let me remind everyone that each one of these persons connected to families, family members, friends, you know, relatives, uh, whose lives have been forever changed. And to point out again the significance of where we are, uh, in the last three days, I don't know if we have the additional charts of what has taken place over the last several months. If, if we have them, if you'll, if you'll bring them up. And I think that reflects That reflects the number of deaths that have taken place in our city uh, per month. Of course, in March, we started off with four deaths in the, month of, in the month of March. And then you go all the way over to June, uh, that was 95. In July, and this represents the last day of July, uh, that number is now 216. And that's 216 persons who have lost their lives in the month of July and we have had a total of 450 people throughout the entire six months. Throughout the entire six months, 450 people who have lost their lives. In the month of July, we have lost nearly half of that number, 216 who have lost their lives in the month of July alone. If you go back to the previous chart that shows the number of positive cases in the city of Houston, I want to highlight something. Uh, in the month of March, it was 377. If you look at the month of May, that number was roughly 3,700. In the month of uh, July, uh, that number, and I can't see it. Um, what is that number in July? It's 26,000. But the point I want to emphasize, in the last three days, in the last three days, when you count the number of roughly 1,500 today, 1,300 on yesterday, uh, that's, uh, that's 2,800. And 1,000 the day before, that's 3,800. In the last three days, the last three days, more people have been reported testing positive than in the entire month of May combined. In the last three days of July. And the point that I want to make to Houstonians is that uh, this virus is still moving rampant within our community. And it is a very important, as we move into August, that we are acting with the greatest degree of intentionality in terms of doing everything we can uh, to uh, slow down the spread of this virus. And not only to slow it down, but to really crush it and to really bring it down uh, tr dramatically in the month of August. We cannot go into August, and the numbers in August are greater than the numbers in July, and then talk about going to school in September. Irrespective, and with all due respect to the state attorney general, 
with all due respect, there is no way under the sun I would allow even my child to go to a school if these numbers are the same or greater in the, by the end of August. I think I have to exercise enough sense to know I'm not going to send my child into a building that I know where there's a serious risk of contacting or contracting this virus. These numbers must come down. So again, this message as we proceed, as we get ready to face the weekend, for those who are tempted to go to these BYOB places, to go to restaurants that are turning themselves into bars, for bars who are attempting to stay open when you should be closed, for people who engage in activities with large gatherings, more than 10, whether outside or inside, house parties, whether in the backyard, in the swimming pool, or inside. Those activities should be a no-no in the city of Houston. And until our behavior change, this virus is going to be around. And everyone is going to be impacted. Businesses are going to be impacted because people are not going to want to go inside and patronize them. Parents are going to be confused about school. And athletes will be playing in the, in the stadiums and in the fields all by themselves. Unless we dramatically change our behavior and starve this virus of the energy that it needs. And quite frankly, at this point in time with these numbers, we shouldn't have to wait on the governor or anybody else to re hit the reset button. We ought to have enough information for us to hit the reset button ourselves. And we need to hit the reset button. We must, we must change our behavior dramatically such that we do not repeat in August what we are seeing in the month of July. And we have squandered already all the gains that we achieved in the months of March and April. Amid an unprecedented health crisis that has killed more than 400 Houstonians and infected thousands of our family, friends, and neighbors, today I'm announcing a second rental assistance package to help those who lost their jobs and are struggling financially because of COVID-19. The city is doing what it can to address an overwhelming need, and it is an overwhelming need for rental assistance in May, the city offered the first rental assisted package of $15 million in CARES Act money, which assisted nearly 13,000 families. And I want to thank the members of city council uh, for joining in and supporting that effort. Since the start of the COVID pandemic, city council has approved more than $26 million in funding specifically for COVID housing response with another $30 million homeless farms announced and in the process of being approved. This time, today, the city of Houston is creating a $19 million rent relief package. Of that amount, $15 million will come from the city's allotment of CARES Act, CARES Act funding and $4 million donated by private sources. And I will add $4 million that have been raised in the last 36 hours uh, which will add to that 15 million. I want to give a, um, a huge thank you to the Houston Endowment. Two million dollars will come from the Houston Endowment. One million dollars will come from the Greater Houston COVID-19 Response uh, Recovery Fund. And one million dollars will come from the Kinder Foundation. I want to thank Houston Endowment, the Greater Houston COVID-19 Recovery Fund, and the Kinder Foundation for their generous support. Included in the $19 million total, money will be set aside for Lone Star Legal Aid. And Donna uh, will be speaking uh, in terms of what they are doing. But I want to thank Lone Star Legal Aid for its continuous work, not just going forward, but what it has done in the past. And so money will be going there. And for those who need assistance but do not qualify for CARES Act dollars, in the previous allotment of 15, there were many people who simply were not eligible and did not qualify. But the dollars that are coming outside of the 15th from the city of Houston 
will be able to provide some support to that population. Our objective is to help the most vulnerable. Our priority is to ensure quick assistance to help families avoid evictions, working alongside landlords, willing to provide flexibility and compassion to keep their tenants housed. The rental assistance will not be allocated on a first come first served basis, but rather we intend to provide a lifeline to those facing immediate eviction with the greatest need and we will work through that process over the next few days. I also want to thank the Houston Apartment Association for its partnership claim and voluntarily agreeing to work with tenants to provide a grace period for those who may have few options. Like our first rental assistance package announced in May, Baker Ripley will administer the program working with landlords. For renters, this option removes the debt obligation instead of putting them further in debt with a moratorium that only deepens the financial hole. And let me repeat that. What we are attempting to do is not to place renters in a deeper hole, but to remove the liability of many of many of them. I also thank Lone Star Legal Aid, which we intend to allocate funding to provide legal and education assistance so they can help tenants to better understand their rights and responsibilities. Our announcement today will make a difference in, in the lives of thousands of Houston families, parents and children, and career professionals and may have who may have lost their jobs during the public health crisis through no fault of their, of their own. We know we must do everything we can, but we also realize that without significant rental assistance fund funds from Congress, our efforts and the above funding will not nearly be enough. The need is great, and I am calling on the state of Texas and the federal government to step up and help us. Cities cannot do this alone. We cannot. The need is too great. This is a global pandemic. It's a global pandemic. And today, people are running out of the protections that were previously afforded by Congress. And tomorrow starts a new month. And people are concerned. And they are scared. And they are desperate. And they are having to deal with the stress and the anxiety. And so we are going to do our part. And I will readily admit it won't meet every need. But we're going to do our part with what we have. But Congress, if you are listening, Mr. President, if you are listening, people need your help, and they need your help now. To the state of Texas, cities and counties are not the only ones who receive CARES funding. The state of Texas received CARES funding. And the people in the city of Houston are not just Houstonians. They are Texans. They are Texans. They need your help. When it comes to the heavy lifting, it should not be left to local governments alone. And so I am pleading with Congress, with the president, with our state officials to join us in providing additional assistance and support to people who need our help the very most. And if we work together, then I believe we can benefit a lot of families, and especially, especially our children. Let me, let me bring up Clay Hicks with the Houston Apartment Association. Clay. Thank you. Amazing, Mayor Turner. Thank you. My name is Clay Hicks. I'm the president of TDC Management at the Dinnerstein Companies and also this year's president of the Houston Apartment Association. And as a nonprofit trade association, we represent thousands of people across the city who work in the apartment industry, providing housing for more than a million Houston area residents. Since this pandemic began, our members have deferred millions of dollars in rent and waived millions of dollars in late fees for those who have been affected by COVID to keep residents in their homes. As you remember, HA and its members started a rental assistance fund back in April with the Alliance of Community Assistance Ministries 
to show our support of the programs Mayor Turner, the city, and county have been able to provide. But those contributions and deferrals have put a huge strain on the small business owners who operate nearly half of Houston's apartments. And we believe rental assistance is the best way to remedy the stress being put on both housing providers and residents. We all know there are large expenses and overhead to provide housing across our great city. And without the monthly rental income, the landlords and apartment properties can't employ and maintain the thousands of workers that keep our properties running, including the maintenance teams who've become so vital during this time, taking care of the properties, cleaning and disinfecting daily while everyone stays at home. We won't be able to afford the utilities or pay the property taxes that keep our police officers on patrol, our firefighters responding, and our public schools operating if we don't have the rental income coming in. So on behalf of the Houston Apartment Association and all the essential workers who operate and maintain apartments, I want to thank Mayor Turner and Houston City Council for their leadership during this difficult time and for their foresight in considering additional rental assistance, which will be critical in keeping Houston renters in their homes. Thank you. Thanks, Clay. Now let me bring on Donna Carney. Um, it's spelled D-A-N-A. -A. Um, I think her, her parents kind of misspelled it, but the pronunciation is Donna. Donna Carney. <laughs> Donna, with Lone Star Legal Aid. Donna. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Donna Carney, and I am the managing attorney for a right to counsel um, eviction pilot at Lone Star Legal Aid. I want to thank the mayor. I'm sorry, I'm struggling here with my mask uh, and speaking at the same time. I need to thank the mayor and city council because um, this is certainly a very moving time and an overwhelming time uh, for the city. We sit in a very unique perch at Lone Star Legal Aid, representing tenants when they are faced at that moment that they are about to lose their housing. And we recognize the commitment from the city and we're very appreciative for all of that dedication from the city of Houston. Lone Star Legal Aid has been dedicated to disaster response in hurricanes, in floods, and now in pandemics. Lone Star Legal Aid has received millions of dollars in federal, state, city, and local grants over many years to provide lawyers with help so that we can help those who can least help themselves with legal issues following such disasters. And in our commitment to help tenants now through this pandemic, Lone Star Legal Aid is launching an eviction right to counsel along with a coalition of other legal services providers in the city of Houston. We are hopeful that this will provide tenants an opportunity to enjoy that same access to the courtroom that so many others have who can afford counsel, but in this case cannot. And so we're very uh, pleased with that um, generous um, ability of the city to provide funding and um, cannot thank you enough. We certainly want uh, tenants to understand their rights and not only provide them with education, but provide them uh, with the legal representation that they need. And we tend to be a critical partner of um, working with a Lone Star uh, Legal Aid that does some incredible work. So thank you. Let me also call on now Council Member Tiffany Thomas, who has uh, the Housing Committee and is very instrumental um, in these uh, programs. Council Member Thomas. Thank you, Mayor, and to my colleagues um, and the rest of the administration that's joining today. When the coronavirus first hit, um, housing was one of the first uh, items that council started discussing with the mayor and his administration. We wanted to make sure that we combat this virus by keeping people in place. And we can't keep people in place when they are on the verge of being evicted out of their homes. We demonstrated with the first round our best effort to keep people safe um, and stable during this time. And as the mayor, um, eloquently shared, it is nearly not enough. Um, there might be five, I think four of my colleagues are joining me today, but we represent the complete horseshoe. And I think it's very important for the community to understand that uh, advocating and discussing 
um, and keeping housing as a priority does not start or stop at the horseshoe. We, ha we have had a series of conversations with the mayor, uh, his administration, and ourselves about what we could do to make sure that our residents can stay in their home. I want to also um, include that even if you are not, uh, even if you are renting a single family home, um, if you have a lease, you do qualify for this program. And we want to make sure that all Houstonians, whatever their housing option is, that they have an opportunity to preserve this. And I also want to say that um, this is a great example of how private industry, philanthropy, and the city government and our nonprofit community works together to make sure Houstonians, our very resilient Houstonians, can stay in place. So thank you again for us moving forward, and we will continue to have discussions about how we roll out the program. And let me also add that it's also important, and I don't, I don't want to leave out our justice of the peace, because they are critical partners in this process. And I'm asking them again uh, to be very sensitive, as I know many of them are, uh, to the needs of people who have been impacted specifically by COVID-19, okay, specifically by COVID-19. Uh, and so they can help. There are some of the JPs who have said that they will not be engaged in eviction proce proceedings uh, through the month of August. I want to thank them for that. But I also want to ask others, uh, JPs, Justice of the Peace, to also be sensitive to that. This is a collective effort. It takes all of us working on behalf of the people in our um, in our community, uh, so, um, and, and, and same thing, uh, our school board, our superintendents and school boards, uh, they can be effective, meaningful advocates uh, in this process as well um, to help to stabilize families. So if we all work together, I think we can make some meaningful gains. Let me bring up now Tom McCassin, the Director of Housing and Community Development. Tom. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, I think you and the other speakers have said just about everything that needs to be said. Uh, let me uh, just say thank you to Baker Ripley, who's been a terrific partner through the first phase, Claudia Gide and uh, Renee Solis, who without them, this would not have happened in, the, in phase one, and we will rely on them heavily in phase two. And then to all of our nonprofit partners who sit with the tenants and bear witness to their pain during this period of time. We know that it's tough to be there, and we know that you're taking on a lot of responsibility on your shoulders, so we thank you for that as we move forward. Um, and then, Mayor, I just want to say that we are looking forward to learning lessons from the first phase as well as learning best practices from around the state, and we look forward to having the conversation with the adv advocacy groups to make sure that as we move forward, we are getting the most impact for the dollars that we spend. Looking forward to the second phase as we do what we can at the city and wait for the federal and state uh, f uh, government to do uh, their part as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And let me also say that as, as it relates to the fund, the fund today is $19 million. That's where we are today. There are a number of calls that I have out, and uh, I am hoping that this fund will grow uh, between now and council members and Wednesday. Uh, the goal is to try to get this fund up uh, anywhere between 20 and $25 million. So, uh, certainly for those, for those individuals who understand uh, the seriousness and the depth of the situation and the need that exists, uh, I would ask you to also join and contribute. Uh, the dollars are all going to Baker Ripley that will be the implementers of this program. These are not coming to the city of Houston. Uh, even the city of Houston's dollars will be headed over to Baker Ripley. And so uh, for those who want to contribute, um, businesses, corporations, you name it, to get this fund up beyond 19 million to meet the critical need that exists within our community. Uh, let me ask that you uh, uh, give to give us a call. Uh, quite frankly, uh, you know, I I got your name. I know where you are. I'll be calling you myself. Uh, so uh, please take my call. Uh, it'll be a, a no caller ID uh, uh, ringing. Uh, now let me bring up uh, let me bring up Councilmember uh, Evan Shabazz, who has also been a leading advocate. Uh, who calls me late at night uh, on a daily basis uh, in reference to this program, but truly has been a champion of providing winter relief. Councilmember Shabazz. Thank you so much, Mayor, and I am just so greatly appreciative for the dollars that are coming to the community. We certainly recognize that more is needed, and the Mayor put out an eloquent plea that I hope that people will listen to and adhere to. 
And so I'm so very, very glad that, especially with school starting, we need to be mindful that homeless children will have a very difficult time accessing virtual learning if they do not have a home. We also know that this disease, this virus, can be exacerbated when people are homeless. And so we need as much help as we can. And I'm so very thankful for the leadership of the chair of the housing committee, council member Tiffany Thomas, and certainly the mayor. He's been so gracious. He takes my text all time of the night, and I really appreciate it. But the most important thing is that the people of Houston will have another day, another month, to live in hopefully safe, safe accommodations. And we will continue to push forward to try to provide as much as we can. And I want the people out there to know that we are listening. We are listening and we are sensitive and we are working towards everything we can to give you as much relief in a safe environment. And I thank you so very much, Mayor. Councilmember Cisneros. Thank you, Mayor. I think most of everything that needs to be said has been said. I just wanted to add my, my gratitude to this program. Um, it's, we know it's not enough. We know it's not enough, and it's a temporary thing. We must have help from the, the, the federal government, from the state government. One of the things that my, my office is doing is we've been, um, just today, we sent out letters to apartment owners. I think we sent 40 letters out to apartment owners and managers asking them to also join us in a letter writing campaign, you know, to our congressional representatives. And um, we've provided templates that they can also share with their tenants because I think the more that, that those leaders hear from us, you know, the more powerful our voice will be. And we've already gotten commitments from some, you know, some responses back from some congressional leadership saying, yes, they're, they agree, but I think it arms them. It gives them more to stand on and more to fight with. So I hope, I hope that, you know, that we'll get a good response and, and that people will take the, you know, the, um, the letter writing campaign seriously because truly, you know, um, our voices matter and they need to be heard. Thank you very much. Councilman Pollock, you good? Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to my colleagues. Um, this is a great day. Uh, we've been asking for rental relief for some time. Uh, several months ago, my colleague Tiffany Thomas and I wrote the mayor a letter regarding this issue, and we were working through the first phase to get out uh, the initial um, 15 million, and now we're in phase two. Uh, like Doc Director McCaslin says, we'll learn a lot from the first phase and hopefully um, make this round even more efficient I represent District J. Over 85% of the residents in my district live in apartments. And I see firsthand how um, the coronavirus has impacted their lives. And so this relief fund uh, is a great next step to make sure that they are remaining in their homes and under a roof. Because um, we understand if they're not able to stay under their roof, what are they going to do? They're going to have to go and stay with their neighbors or their friends in another apartment complex. And what's going to happen? they're not going to be able to socially distance. And if they're not able to socially distance, then the community spread uh, will increase. And so it will have a trickle-down effect. So thank you, Mayor, uh, for all of your efforts, all the community partners for all that you do uh, for this effort. And I'm looking forward to having uh, this be a successful fund. Thank you. Sergeant, this ordinance will be on the agenda uh, this coming Wednesday. Dr. Purse, why don't you come right and give your report? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we have a slide today to capitalize on something we talked about the other day. That's the decrease in the amount of tests that are occurring at our, uh, our City of Houston sponsored test sites. And we've talked about how there's been a decrease. And some of the, uh, the decrease that you're going to see on the slide here in just a moment, uh, some of that has to do with bad weather days. So some of those deep spikes were from the bad weather days. But you can see there's been a dramatic decrease in the amount of testing that's been going on. So we, you know, it's hard to find out exactly why this is occurring. So you can't really go to the people who didn't show up and ask them why they didn't show up um, or why they didn't register. 
so a lot of it is speculation on our part. So one thing may be that that there is a, uh, you know, at, at some point there was long lines that has been resolved, and certainly when we don't have the people coming, uh, there aren't long lines. So if anyone wasn't going because of long lines, that's not currently an issue, uh, not only because of the decreased number of people going and getting tested, but also because we improved our processes over, over the time. There may also have been, uh, well, actually, let me just sort of jump to what I'm afraid, what I'm fearful is that people somehow think that the situation is resolved because we're getting some good news out of the Texas Medical Center, I want to remind folks that the number, good numbers are coming from the hospitals, both the TMC and SETRAC. It's not because the virus isn't spreading. It's because the physicians and the nurses and the technicians at the hospital have, got, have gotten better. They've come to understand this disease better. And so the length of stay in the hospital has gotten shorter. Also, folks who had to stay in the hospital before, now due to improvement in the home health care setting, some people can go home sooner than they could have before. Again, shortening the amount of time someone's in the hospital. And then the third thing is that the average age of the people who are testing positive is getting younger. And so that's good news in that they don't need hospitalization. That is bad news in that it is still shows there's a lot of virus spreading. So as, while the testing numbers are going down, our positivity rates, which as you know we report on Mondays, is still high. So it has been as high as 25.9% about five weeks ago. And then last uh, Monday of this week we reported it had dropped all the way down to 23.3%. And of course I'm using a little emphasis there to point out the fact that is a very, very small change. And so um, I'm concerned that the message is getting mixed, that people think that because we're getting some good news from the hospitals. Remember, the hospitals, that's a late, that's a lagging indicator. By the time somebody gets in the hospital, the virus has spread quite a bit. We're hearing lots of stories about how there's a virus that spreads through whole entire families, and one or two of those folks may wind up in the hospital. And remember, if you wind up in the hospital, you're very sick. Also remember that even when you look at the hospital data, that the total number of folks in the hospital is coming down, but the number of people in the intensive care units is not coming down a whole lot. So today, right now in Harris County, there's over 600 people that are diagnosed with COVID disease in intensive care units. And that number has been fairly steady for uh, many weeks now. And those people are very, very sick. And just yesterday, Chief Pena talked about how we have one of our own firefighter paramedics who's in intensive care. He is extremely ill, and his family is extremely scared. So I just want to point out that while we don't, we, there's a little bit of mixed messages perhaps going on, and we're trying to be truthful and transparent, but I want to make sure that the public understands the virus is still out there. It's still very active. We, this is not the time to drop our guard. So please get tested, okay? What we've been noticing, a number of people who are going to get tested, that number has come down, okay? We've expanded our testing capacity. Um, and so, again, I'm encouraging people in the city of Houston, please, please take advantage and go and get tested. Please do that, okay? Please do that. Okay, having said that, we'll stop and take whatever questions you may have. Hi, Mayor. Um, oh, hi, KPRC hi. Pool. Uh, we have several questions sure. on the rental uh, okay. program and then one on hospital. Clay, don't leave too soon just in case there's a question. Um, this is from KPRC. The email we got from TMO a short time had a good point as far as people who don't have access to internet or internet as fast as others to be able to apply for funds since they ran out so quick last time. What is being done to ensure the money is getting to those who need it the most and playing field is even for everyone to apply and not just those who can access the applications quickest? And that's a good question. Uh, what we learned from last time, the first come, first serve, didn't work as well as we would have liked. And, uh, and literally, those, those monies were obligated in 90 minutes. Doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the people who needed it the most uh, received it. So we're not going to a first come, first serve. Uh, we're going to be working very closely with Councilmember Tiffany Thomas and other city council members and working with um, um, Baker Ripley, I had a mental block for a moment, uh, Baker Ripley uh, and others to try to design a, a metrics that will, will best meet the, those who need the dollars the most. 19 million is not going to cover everyone, so we really want to focus on who needs it most. At the same time, uh, last time we were restricted as to who could get the dollars because they're just federal dollars. Now we're, com we're combining that with non-federal dollars, which means that there are certain groups, populations, immigrants, and others who were not eligible before, but we can, we can also provide assistance to that group now this time around. So we've learned a lot. Tom, is there anything? So there are, some, there are, so there are lessons that we learned the last time. 
uh, that we wanted to implement this time. And that's why over the next several days, I'm going to be working very closely uh, with Council Member Tiffany Thomas to kind of streamline the process, put in, in fact, a good matrix. Okay, this is from Univision. Um, will the rental assistance benefit all residents, regardless of their immigration status? Uh, and are you considering an eviction grace period ordinance to help those Houstonians who are not able to pay for August rent or next month's rent? It won't rent? be an, an, an ordinance, but the good news is with the Houston Apartment Association, with Clay and his team, uh, they are working to voluntarily ag uh, agree uh, to a grace period. So we're going to be working in collaboration with them. So, for example, people who, who get assistance with their particular apartment complex, that they will honor, for example, a voluntary grace period that even would go beyond, for example, that one month. Okay? Mm -hmm. It could be you get the assistance, it may be for one month, but the apartments will agree to go two to three months in terms of a grace period. And that's the partnership that we're establishing with the Houston Apartment Association, and we're working out the details of that arrangement as well. Um, Ada, can you come in and, and say that? Spanish. I'm still, my, all my words are not there. And <laughs> I don't want to mess up, you know, I'm, I'm still kind of going through my tr translation. So, um, habla en uh, español uh, te la speaker. You need to ask it again? Or you, <laughs> yes, please. Okay. okay, so they were talking about the rental assistance benefit, all residents, regardless of their immigration status. Mm -hmm. status. Are you considering an eviction grace period ordinance to help those Houstonians who are not able to pay for August rent or the next month's rent. Bueno, sí se está considerando, ¿verdad? Y se va a evaluar, pero ahorita estamos vamos a trabajar con lo que lo que tenemos y definitivamente este si como, si podemos evaluar y aprobar, les, este les decimos al público. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> that was that was short. <laughs> yeah, um, I think she and she mixed up a few of those uh, what I, my thoughts, but she got the gist. Okay. And now this is from KTRK. Um, okay. Pretty much the question that, you know, about it being administered, a lot of people missed out, website crashed. They want to know how things are going to be done differently, but also Harris County passed a similar package on Tuesday. Yes. But Westside commissioners cut out all of their city of Houston areas. How do you feel about that? And will there be a grace period for renters? I guess. I, I can't. Um don't quite know why the, uh, the West Side may have cut out anybody in the city of Houston, but I would tell you what we will attempt to do is take a look at uh, the program that they're implementing mm -hmm. and then kind to, uh, what's the right word, um, work alongside so that we don't have double dipping and we can expand the reach. And uh, we'll, they are utilizing Baker Ripley. We are also utilizing Baker Ripley. Okay. And so the goal is to kind of line those programs up so that we can meet even a greater population. So the people that they will be benefiting, we're not going to come across and come back and duplicate. So we eliminate the double dipping, and we can have one provider, so to speak, or implementer that's covering the program. Now, I have one about hospitalizations, but Texas Tribune has um, more on the rentals. They okay. have several here. Uh, let's see. Uh, will these funds be distributed on a first-come, first-served basis? No. How are you making yourself sure that this will reach all populations and won't run out in just a few hours? No first come first, uh, no first come first serve basis this time around. Uh, we want to drive these dollars to where the most needs, uh, where the needs are. We want, we'll be working in collaboration with the Houston Apartment Association. So we want to leverage our dollars. For example, if let's say apartment complexes, uh, tenants are being benefited. We don't, we, we're working on an agreement with the Apartment Association, so it's not just that one month where they get in the payment, mm -hmm. but they will voluntarily agree to extend, you know, for the next one to two months in addition to that. So we'll, the good news is that we're working in conjunction with the Houston Apartment Association, and they are voluntarily agreeing, uh, many of their members, to enter into a voluntary grace period, and we're going to leverage the two. And I believe you said that undocumented workers or immigrants, excuse me, would be considered on this? Yes, that, that's, the, that's the beauty of getting dollars becoming beyond the federal CARES dollars. And those dollars are limited, but with the additional dollars that we are receiving, we'll be allocating a portion to that population. And how are you making sure that the Hispanic community is informed on how to access these funds? There's going to be a lot of messaging uh, between now and then. Uh, the ordinance will be on the ballot on Wednesday, and at that point in time, um, many of the questions and the processes will be, uh, will be um, uh, determined. Did I say, what did I say? 
Oh, did I say battle? <laughs> will be on the agenda. Uh, <laughs> will be on the agenda on Wednesday, and then uh, we'll be working very closely with my entire communications team and the Houston uh, media sources to make sure that we get that information out. Certainly want to work very closely with Univision and uh, all the other media outlets to make sure that people clearly understand. And this is their last one. San Antonio, a smaller city than Houston, has dedicated more than 50 million to rent assistance. Are, are two rounds of 15 million enough, especially when there isn't an eviction moratorium or a grace period for renters? Quite frankly, there's just, there's, it's never enough. The needs are, the needs are great. Uh, in this sense, when you can take the, fifth, uh, the 15 along with the, uh, let's say the 19 that we are providing, um, that takes you to 35. We've also, uh, bear in mind, the county and the city collaborative, the 65 million that we are putting to keep people from falling into a state of homelessness and, and uh, renters uh, receiving some of that. So if you take into account the 65 million between the city and the county, uh, the, the 15, 9, 20, the, the 34 million that's coming here, and we're hoping to grow this, that fund, the 19, even between now and Wednesday. I think we're moving, we're, we're doing what we can to meet the need. And certainly for, uh, for those philanthropists, endowments, uh, corporations, businesses, who also want to contribute to this fund uh, to help us meet the, the needs of vulnerable families in our, in our city, uh, I would ask them to contribute uh, to it. Uh, the fund, they can contribute to Baker Ripley and dedicate those dollars specifically for rental, for the city of Houston's rental relief program. This last one I have from Telemundo, it's on hospitalization. Earlier this week, DSHS reported that an incomplete hospitalization numbers caused the appearance of a drop in hospitalizations. Are Houston hospitals providing complete hospitalization data and does our local hospital data show an increase or decrease in hospitalizations? Yeah, so we've had this before where there have been um, incomplete data reporting from the hospitals way back, you know, in the beginning in, in uh, March and April. And so it does still occur from time to time. It's not been a chronic problem. Uh, and so again, I've said this many times, don't pay attention to any one number, but look at the trend of the graphs because there are going to be data errors like that. And so, um, Locally, I don't think that we've, we've had it. I didn't see it uh, in our local numbers. Not any big glitches, but um, it, it can happen. Again, look at the curve, not any one data point. Yes, ma'am. Um, I guess you may um, iron out the details at City Council this week, but is the fund going to be structured the same way the first round was um, in terms of the money that goes directly to landlords, not to renters? The structure may remain the same, but in terms of uh, the criteria will certainly change. Um, the one big problem that we had the last time was first come, first serve. Mm -hmm. And consequently, people were rushing in and, you know, on the internet, telephone, and what we all concluded, you know, we were trying to get the money out the door, but that was not necessarily the best approach. So we're not going to do that. Uh, so it won't be first come, first serve. We will develop a sort of matrix criteria. Uh, the goal is to assist those with the most need and then to um, coordinate our, the dollars that we are bringing to the table with the Houston Apartment Association so that we can expand the reach even beyond the dollars themselves. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if um, Mr. McCasland is here, but I am kind of curious to know if there are any mechanisms in place um, to make sure from the first round that, you know, tenants weren't evicted after that funding was released? Let's, let's find the answer. He's not here, but let's, let's find the, let's find the, we'll find the answer to that. Okay, great. Um, I, I wanted to ask Clay Hicks about um, how he feels about a grace period ordinance, but he's gone. Um, so um, since there are so many council members here, I would love to know if any of you um, would want to speak in terms of whether or not you support a grace period ordinance. I just talked with him. <laughs> so regarding a grace period ordinance, it is something that we have discussed as council members and with the administration. Uh, it is something that we recognize that other cities have done. But Houston is a unique city, and we have a unique dynamics. 
I think uh, with our work in collaboration with the county, we're going to be very creative in the policies that we put uh, in place as it pertains to this relief fund that I think will achieve some of the same uh, end goals that a grace period ordinance will do. Thank you. I am so encouraged uh, to know that the Houston Apartment Association is going to work out those kinds of um, agreements with the apartment, uh, with the tenants and the apartments. And hopefully, I hope that that's the beginning of others that want to do it because certainly it could be done voluntarily, um, not necessarily with an ordinance, but certainly I would support anything that gives our renters uh, relief and the ability to remain in their homes and make arrangements if possible because of certainly not a balloon payment at the end because we could put them in a, uh, a hole that they can't get out of but certainly an opportunity to help them to remain because I believe that if most people are good renters it would be in the benefit to the benefit rather of the landlords to allow them to work out arrangements because it's very difficult for anyone at this point to come up with first and last month's rent to be able to move into their property. So I think I would bargain more for the, the one in the, the, what is it, the bird in the hand rather than the two in the bush. And I think that I would uh, encourage them, I know that I would encourage them to make these arrangements. Thank you. One of the things, too, is that I was uh, confirmed with the mayor of San Antonio. They don't have a, a moratorium. Uh, but what they do do is that they uh, work to help provide notice uh, to their tenants um, and make them aware of what their rights are. That's one of the reasons why um, uh, I decided, for example, to take some of the dollars and give them over to Lone Star Legal Aid uh, for, for uh, legal representation, uh, to let the tenants know their rights, to educate them. Um, and so some of these dollars uh, will be going to legal aid. And quite frankly, when they have lawyers working with them, uh, that can effectively serve as an effective state. Uh, and so um, um, a significant portion of dollars will be going to Lone Star Legal Aid uh, to assist uh, tenants in their legal representation. Yeah, and you mentioned San Antonio, and, and they, they did take a vote their city council did yeah, take a vote in public. It went down. Yeah. yeah. It failed. Yeah, it did, not, it did not pass. Okay. Thank you all so very much. Marie, how you doing? You didn't have a question? All right. It's, 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 it's good to see you. Councilwoman uh, Carolyn uh, Shabazz. All right. Oh, the mayor, right? <laughs> All right, here on the last day of the month with rent due for thousands of Houstonians tomorrow, the city announcing a new rental assistance package for those folks who are struggling and can't pay their rent. It'll be $19 million, 15 of that federal money, $4 million donated from, um, from local folks. Uh, the important part here, this is not a first-come, first-served program. That's the way the city ran it the first time and found out that a lot of folks couldn't get into the website. It crashed. They could not even apply for that money, much less get it. So the city now is going to try something different with this round of funding and this round of help. They're going to try to make sure it goes to those folks who most need it, who are in you know, imminent danger of getting evicted from their apartments or their homes. So that will uh, go into effect here, and we'll get you more details on how to apply for that money as we get them ourselves. The mayor also today at the beginning here releasing the latest numbers from the city of Houston today. And to end the month, the city has set a new record now for the number of deaths, 18 reported today, a total of 1,554 new COVID cases in the city, almost 47,000 now uh, total since this pandemic began. So you can keep, uh, keep up to date on this with our mobile app, always a great way to do that at khou.com, our website, or the KHOU 11 mobile app. We'll let you know when one of these press conferences starts. If you're away from your TV, you can watch on your phone or your tablet by doing that. We'll take a quick break here. The 411 starts in about three minutes. We're also expecting to hear from 
uh, Harris County's Judge Lena Hidalgo. She's responding to the governor and uh, the Attorney General, the State Attorney General, about uh, public schools opening. So we're going to hear from her a little bit later as well. The 411's coming up here in just a couple of minutes. We'll see you soon. I realized I never really come along for myself. I was just feeding his aliveness. I'll never get to really be his parent again. He needs to know that I fought for him. I got into the trailer too yeah. that time. I was really yeah. great. I, now I know what it's about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Marriage Story is in theaters <laughs> November 6th. You can also watch it on Netflix starting December 6th with this one year subscription. And I want to thank Scarlett Johansson, Joe Kinnaman.